Chang from Los Angeles. This is Bloomberg Technology. Coming up, Facebook is getting into chips, hopping on a larger trend as big tech brings chip making in-house. What it means for Intel, Qualcomm, and the like. Plus, we hear from Bill Gates, why the Microsoft founder told us that the government has a responsibility to regulate new tech. And our exclusive with Discovery CEO David Zaslav. What is Discovery's strategy for streaming? That conversation ahead. But first, to our lead, U.S. stocks edged higher on Wednesday as investors parsed a mixed bag of earnings. The S&P 500 posted a third straight gain. Meantime, IBM's weak results dragged the Dow Jones industrial average to a loss. For more, we are joined by Romain Bostic, editor of Bloomberg's Top Live blog in New York. So Romain, obviously earnings having an impact here, a big week this week, and an even bigger earnings week next week. That's right. I mean, geopolitics had sort of been driving this market in both directions for the last few weeks, but earnings are back from and center. In fact, what was up today and what was down today was almost directly tied to what we saw on the profit and revenue side. S&P and NASDAQ posting some decent gains today. Uh, they were up pretty solidly early in the day, though they did sell off a little bit into the close, managed to finish up higher. Five of the 11 S&P sectors rising today, led by energy, industrials, and materials. Dow transports were up about 1.7% today, but the Dow industrial average itself actually fell. As you mentioned, IBM, the main drag there. IBM shares falling the most since 2013 after its earnings report raised doubts about its growth turnaround and whether or not that company was really on the path that many investors had thought it to be. In fact, about 83 index points were stripped out of the Dow solely because of IBM alone. Of course, there were some positive aspects here coming out of earnings today. Names like United Continental, Textron, as well as CSX helped to uh, give a little bit of boost in other areas of the market. So far for this earnings season, it's still pretty early. About 52 companies in the S&P 500 have reported. About 41% of them so far reporting EPS beats to the upside, Emily. And of course, we haven't yet gotten to the big slate of tech earnings. We'll have to wait until next week uh, before those start to roll in. Right. Lots of tech companies reporting next week. How are stocks performing? Well, I mean, we're seeing a little bit of action here in some of the tech spakes. In fact, the large cap, mega cap tech companies actually back in play this week big time. I mean, we saw uh, uh, the NASDAQ 100 is actually up about 3% so far this week through the first three days of this week. You take a look at a company like Amazon, it's up 7% on the week. In fact, it was up 1.6% today alone. Also take a look at uh, a company like Tesla. That's back in play after a couple of bad days. Elon Musk finally sort of addressing the company's production and cost issues in a way that Wall Street itself actually appears to like. Even Micron surging 3% today. It was down about 3% earlier in the day. That was after that Lamb research uh, came out with its earnings report. Uh, but after uh, some uh, the Micron investors at least sort of assessed it, realized it wasn't that bad for Micron, that sent the shares back up. And then, of course, I want to take a look at Netflix, too. They're up about 7% on the week, but they did give back some of their gains today. And that's largely because there is some concern that the stock may have actually peaked. Now, the if you want to look at the bear case for Netflix, people are looking at that $18 plus billion dollars in cost commitments they have for streaming content, as well as billions more that they have in debt commitments. And they're saying that there's no way this company is going to generate enough cash to meet those obligations down the road. Of course, there's still a strong bull case for the stock. And that's simply that subscriber growth continues to go up. Uh, there seems to be no end to that. And the company has a lot of pricing power that seems to be giving a lift to this company and potentially the stock. Keep in mind, Netflix, it's still the best performer in both the NASDAQ 100 and the S&P 500 year to date, up about 74 percent, Emily. All right, Romain Bostic, Bloomberg's Romain Bostic, thank you so much for breaking that down. Sticking with Netflix, we are joined now by RBC Capital Markets analyst Mark Mahaney, who covers Netflix. So, Mark, obviously the stock on the way up. You've got an outperform. You know, what's your take on the latest growth and if it can keep up? Uh, yeah, I think it's sustainable. I think what uh, is happening with Netflix is fundamentally an inflection point. Uh, that happens when revenue growth accelerates and margins expand of the large tech 
kind of internet names, the FANG names, Facebook, Amazon, Netflix, Google, this is the only one, maybe Amazon, but this is the one that's clearly offering accelerating revenue growth and expanding margins. Why? Because they've got pricing power. They just implemented a price increase both in the U.S. and internationally, and there's been no slowdown in subs, i.e., they've got pricing power. People think that this package is worth $10, 11 12 dollars and are willing to pay up for it. And then secondly, they're really starting to break through in international markets. We saw that in some of the Asian markets, even in really difficult markets like Japan. We think it's also happening in Latin America and in Western Europe. This idea of con uh, this, this concept of streaming is really taking, uh, grabbing people's imaginations. And then what's behind that, I guess if there's a third factor, is all this content that the company is uh, offering. And if you want to think about it this way, think about it this way. If for every dollar that you spend with Netflix on that monthly subscription, you get access to a billion dollars worth of content. That's a better deal than you can find almost anywhere. And it's really resonating with consumers. So yes, we think the growth is very sustainable. We like the stock even on the gap up here. And talk to us a little bit about the competition. Obviously, the streaming race continues to change. You've got Apple getting into original content. You've got Netflix spending big. You've got a lot of content out there. In fact, some people say we're in a TV bubble. You know, can Netflix continue to buck the trend? That's one of the biggest uh, you know, bare arguments that's brought up. The first one is whether they can continue to spend at these levels efficiently. Can they finance all that spend? And the second one is, you know, what about these other mega companies like the Apples and the Amazons? And I just, I just give you this historical context, uh, Emily, and I know you know this uh, very well. Netflix has always had major com competition, whether it was Walmart or the big blockbuster that used to be big, or, or Amazon in the past. Uh, I actually think that Netflix's ability to compete is what's really changed. Not that it's a competitive landscape. It's, uh, it's Netflix's ability to compete because they've gotten so much bigger, 120 million subs worldwide, and that's allowed them to spend so much more. There's nobody who can really economically match their spend levels in terms of content, spending eight, nine, 10 billion a year because nobody's got that paying customer base that, that uh, Netflix has. So I actually think that that's the, the table stakes are rising each and every year, and I would, I would expect that every year Netflix is going to increase by about a billion dollars the total amount of money that it spends on content. Chances of somebody catching up to Netflix each year get tougher and tougher. So of the competitors out there, you know, which do you think will be the biggest challenge to Netflix? Well, the, the two that uh, I focus on probably the most, one is Amazon and probably the other is Apple. And I'm not, I don't think Google is a real competitive threat as a consumer subscription business. They just don't have, that's not their core competency. Amazon could, I just don't think that Amazon wants to directly take on Netflix. I think Amazon's got a golden ring that's somewhere else and that golden ring is Prime. They want to use video to get people to become Prime members and to stay Prime members because then they'll spend a lot more than just 10 bucks a month with Amazon. They'll spend hundreds with Amazon because they'll keep buying a lot of different products and services uh, from them. And then there's Apple potentially, they certainly got the cash to do something. I just don't think that they have the reach beyond the app, Apple uh, ecosystem. They just can't play as uh, strong in international markets, in Android markets, as uh, as uh, Netflix can. So, you know, they're, they're both very substantial long-term competitors. I just think every year that passes now, I think the competitive challenge gets, uh, or the competitive moats around uh, Netflix's business get deeper and get wider because the sub-base builds and the content spend, the content table stake spend keeps rising. While I have you, Mark, uh, Amazon CEO Jeff Bezos has just published his annual letter to shareholders, some headlines from the letter. They're continuing to invest to expand the customer base, 100 million paid Prime members. Um, Bezos saying that 2017 was the best year yet for hardware sales. Of course, we know Amazon Alexa has been incredibly popular, po incredibly popular. Um, the most units sold in 2017 were by third party sellers. Um, quickly, Mark, we're going to dig into this a little bit later in the show, but your reaction to those uh, new numbers off the top. Well, I guess um, uh, this is instant reaction because I hadn't seen that 100 million prime numbers. I was waiting for that number to come out, and now it's out. Uh, I'm not surprised by that. I think that's a little bit higher, though, than the market would assume. I think the market was assuming 80, 90 million subs, not 100 million. Look, that shows you how popular this program is. And by the way, that's $100 a year each person is spending. So, you know, that's uh, I'm going to get this wrong, but it's about 10 billion, and that's really all profit. Now, of course, they're using that to subsidize or to pay for a lot of things but shows you just how popular this program is getting, uh, the Prime program. And then when he says they're going to continue to invest aggressively, of course he's saying that. Uh, Bezos has been saying that every year. 
And that's the challenge with trying to compete with Amazon. They are willing to invest and are willing to invest aggressively for the long term. It's been the, it's been the key to their success uh, because they've done it successfully. It's been the key to their success uh, to date. And then the, uh, the, the numbers on, um, on the Alexa devices, you know, I think that's uh, something else we'll be looking, peering through that Cheryl the letter to see if we can find. The rise of the third party marketplace has been a key part of the story. It allows margins to rise too. So I, I, you know, I think of all those things you just mentioned to me, Emily, the most interesting one for me is the 100 million prime subs. I think that's higher than the market had thought. And it just tells you just how much uh, platform strength this company has. And I bet you that number goes to 200 million within the next three years. All right, prediction there. Amazon Music Unlimited. Jeff Bezos also saying unlimited members more than doubled um, to six million. Um, we're going to continue to dig through huh. this shareholder letter, bring you more uh, commentary with RBC Capital Markets analyst Mark Mahaney. You are sticking with us. This is Bloomberg. All right, we've got breaking news from Qualcomm. The company says it now has a plan to cut a billion dollars in costs and there will be job cuts as a result of that plan. We're continuing to get headlines in on Qualcomm. We'll bring you more information as we have it. But now back to the story we were talking about earlier, Jeff Bezos publishing his annual letter to Amazon shareholders. I want to bring in Mark Mahaney, RBC Capital Markets, who covers Amazon. Mark, of course, the headline number is Jeff Bezos saying Amazon Prime has surpassed 100 million paid subscribers. We're still reading through the letter. Uh, I mentioned earlier that the number of Music Unlimited customers has doubled, that it's been the best year for hardware uh, for Amazon than ever before. Yet, what's your reaction to that? So let me give uh, let me tee off on two things. That, that 100 million prime number is probably the most important. Uh, the music streaming sub number. So this is what we know in the market. Uh, there's a recently publicly traded company that has north of 70 million, uh, based on its public disclosures, uh, north of 70 million paying streaming subs. Apple has been very clear about how many they have. They now have 40 million. So you know Amazon's got a lot of work to do to catch up to those two, and it probably doesn't. I'm not sure Amazon needs to catch up to those two, but it's a nice service, and it'll be nice incremental business for them. I just, again, the golden ring for Amazon is getting people to sign up for the Prime program. So if music or video gets them to do that, great. And by the way, it has been great because they got 100 million of these. And then finally, in terms of the hardware sales, this is what really matters for Amazon, I think, uh, we think, is, is that getting about 100 million of these Alexa devices out and installed, then you get an ecosystem and then you can start getting what we call Apple tax or Google tax revenue, like a share of all the apps that are sold indirectly or indirectly off those platforms. So the hardware sales were a record year last year for Amazon. I don't find too surprising. We're looking to see how many installed units there are of Alexa devices. We think they get to that 100 million installed device Alexas uh, by the end of, uh, maybe by the end of this year, but certainly somewhere in 19. I am reading through the uh, shareholder now, shareholder letter now from Jeff Bezos, and I want to bring in Spencer Soper, who covers Amazon for Bloomberg, um, with us in Seattle. Uh, Jeff Bezos here, uh, Spencer saying, one thing I love about customers is that they are divinely discontent. Their expert expectations are never static. They go up. It is human nature. You cannot rest on your laurels in this world. Customers won't have it. And he goes on to say, of course, that they will continue to invest for the long term. What are the highlights, Spencer, that you're pulling out of this? Yeah, I think that the 100 million prime members is the big takeaway. Otherwise, it's a lot of familiar themes and, and just kind of like a, a highlight reel of, of, uh, of stats we've seen over the past year. So the, but the big thing really is that 100 million prime subscribers, and it's, it's something that they use as kind of a building block. It's a foundation for them. And we're seeing them more and more add you know, additional tiers to that. Like if you want to pay a little more and get music, great. Do you want to pay a little more and get more video, great. Do you want to pay a little more and get, you know, service like Amazon Fresh? It's become this kind of platform that they can build upon with more a la carte services to, to, make, uh, to make Amazon Prime more, more valuable. So he talks about Prime Video, he talks about Amazon devices. Interestingly, he talks about fashion. Amazon has become the destination for tens of millions of customers to shop for fashion. You know, this is really interesting, you know, given obviously uh, the competition in, in, in retail, in brick and mortar retail, and, you know, uh, the, the challenges facing the retail industry today. Do you think, Mark, that Amazon, you know, can become a, a huge player in fashion or, or really a go-to? 
I wonder about that. Um, they're, they're clearly very large already in clothing and apparel. So. Um, uh, and I'm not the expert on fashion, uh, far from it. But in terms of ready, you know, plain, uh, you know, regular uh, clothing and apparel, yes. High-end fashion, however, that's that that may not work for uh, Amazon. That may be too hard to stretch the brand that far, and that may be where a potential acquisition of a high-end retailer, you know, may may make a lot of sense. Uh, they clearly are doing like very what? well. And kind of, well, what's been rumored what could be on is, the radar. Uh, well, what's rumored is that other uh, high-end retailer that's based in Seattle that begins with an N, Nordstrom. Um, so that you know, it would would Amazon buy a Target? Absolutely not. They don't need to buy any mass market discount retailers. They are the leading mass market discount retailer of the future. But would they look to like an ortho, uh, a complementary acquisition of like a high-end fashion retailer like that? Possibly, if it's a high-quality brand, high-quality management, et cetera. That's what I wonder about. But anyway, that's that's Amazon and fashion. By the way, Emily, we've gone through all of this. Now we haven't mentioned. AWS that must be in the shareholder letter because that's where half of the profits of this uh, business are so I don't know where we're, we're, I haven't seen the letter yet I don't know where that is I know an Amazon investor should be looking for that AWS language because that's you know the half of the story going forwards absolutely it is here it is exciting to see Amazon Web Services a 20 billion dollar revenue run rate business accelerate it's already healthy growth uh, Spencer talk to us about the growth of AWS and what the company expects to see well, it, it really is the fuel for all of Amazon, and it's the thing that gets Amazon a lot of leeway from investors about all of its other kind of very low margin or even money losing uh, initiatives, including its international expansion. Without uh, Amazon's cloud computing segment, Amazon would have been about break even last year. So it's basically fueling everything from its investments in uh, voice activated devices on the Alexa platform to its uh, original video programming that's helping it get people more engaged and get Amazon deeper into people's homes um, to its international expansion, namely, where it's trying to replicate its success in the U.S. abroad, which is really the, the thing that's uh, fueling more and more revenue growth. But yeah, AWS is, at the, is the, the fuel for all of that. He also talks about Whole Foods. He talks about Amazon Go. Lots more to read here. Mark, I'm sure you're anxious to uh, take a look. Uh, Spencer Soper, our Bloomberg News reporter who covers Amazon, and Mark Mahaney, you are sticking with me. We are going to talk about Facebook. Still ahead, turning to Facebook, why the social media company is building a team to design its own semiconductors next. This is Bloomberg. Now to a Bloomberg scoop, Facebook is building a team to design its own semiconductors, this move adding to a trend among tech companies to supply themselves and lower their dependence on chipmakers like Intel and Qualcomm. The social network would join other tech giants tackling the massive effort to develop chips. In 2010, Apple started shipping its own chips and now uses them across many of its major product lines. Alphabet's Google has developed its own AI chip as well. Joining us now, Bloomberg Tech's Sarah Fire, who broke this story and still with us, RBC Capital Markets analyst Mark Mahaney. Sarah, quickly, does this have anything to do with the privacy controversy that Facebook is in the middle of right now? No, this has much more to do with their hardware ambitions, which have been a little hampered by the privacy controversy, like the the speakers that it wants to build for your home that they will not be releasing next, next month as planned. Um, so this is more about connecting the hardware to the software. So, Mark, I'm sure you've been following Facebook very closely. You cover Facebook. You watched uh, Mark Zuckerberg's testimony. You have an outperform on Facebook, but the company was downgraded today. Do you think all of these privacy concerns, the changes that Facebook is making, um, taking less data from 16-year-olds, for example, will this have any impact on the business, on use, and on the revenue brought in from advertisers? I'm going to go out on a limb here and say no. Uh, our advertiser surveys haven't shown any material change in budget allocations to Facebook by uh, by marketers. I don't know whether there's going to be a temporary pause in MAU monthly average user or a DAU daily average user growth, but I doubt it's material. I just don't think there's a great alternative to Facebook unless you want to go to Instagram, and of course that's owned by Facebook. So we may have a we have a temporary PR issue, which I thought Zuckerberg did a pretty good job of addressing on the on the on the on the Hill last 
uh, last week. Uh, my guess is that this turns out to be a temporary uh, slowdown, and I think it actually creates a great buying opportunity in terms of the stock. And what about impending regulation? I mean, there's already legislation being proposed yeah. to you know, enforce greater privacy controls. Well, to counter Mark's point, I would say that Facebook did note in its earnings call in January that GDPR could affect the daily active user numbers in Europe. That's the amount of time amount of uh, times people log in to Facebook daily. So um, that now that they are applying those rules to the rest of the world, we could see a broader impact. Mark. Yeah, it's, uh, it's possible. I'm sorry, two, two points I'd make is one is that I don't think there'd be anything in regulation that would competitively disadvantage Facebook's advertising platform versus other ones. And then on the user side, yeah, it's possible that you'd have, um, you'd shake off some users, but I think the core you know, value proposition of Facebook to users kind of continues to build over time, especially as Facebook Watch and maybe Facebook Marketplace builds out over time. And uh, so I, I, okay. I think you may have a temporary issue, but I doubt it changes the long-term trend. All right, RBC Capital Markets Analyst Mark Mahaney, thank you for joining us for the first half thank hour. You, Bloomberg Tech, Sarah Fryer, thank you as well. Coming up, tech takes on malaria. We'll talk to the man who went from creating Microsoft to trying to rid the world of one of the deadliest diseases. Our conversation with Bill Gates is next. This is Bloomberg. Technology. I'm Emily Chang coming to you from Los Angeles. Back to our top story. Jeff Bezos' annual letter to Amazon shareholders is out. The stock is up in after hours trading. Some highlights from the letter. Amazon has exceeded 100 million paid Prime subscribers and will continue to invest to meet, quote, ever rising customer expectations. Amazon had its best ever year yet for hardware sales, according to the letter. Bezos says Amazon will continue to invest to expand its customer base and Amazon Music members more than doubled to six million. Well, today technology is playing an ever more present role in health care. It is a particularly new developments in data analytics that can help as well as software and AI, which are increasingly helping to spread the impact of infectious diseases. One man who knows well the benefits of tech, Bill Gates, founder of Microsoft and the world's second richest man. He has long been focusing his wealth outside of Silicon Valley, combating infectious disease that affect the poorest. At a malaria summit in London, our Caroline Hyde caught up with the tech luminary. She joins us now. And Caroline, Gates sees a lot of opportunity to combat malaria with technology. Where specifically are those opportunities? Yeah, it's interesting, Emily. I think focusing has always been on data, the use of big data, the ability to, to map, to be able to track outbreaks to be, breaks and be able to target them. Notably, we're also hearing the likes of Google Earth being able to help monitor the outbreaks of such diseases and indeed just the use of smartphones on the ground. But it made me well, perhaps smile somewhat that the founder of the biggest software company in the world, Bill Gates, of course, thinks perhaps the key use should be in software itself. Have a listen. Some of the more advanced software techniques are used to model the disease and so we run rich simulations. Uh, we had to create a new group uh, uh, in super disease modeling to use the very latest software to try and project uh, if we get a new drug how beneficial would that be and you know should we go after the mosquitoes or go after the human reservoir. Um, uh, even drug design uh, some of the advanced modeling techniques are, are letting us speed up that process of picking molecules um, and making sure they don't, they don't have side effects. So you know, anything that helps you know, cure malaria, cure cancer, uh, that's you know, a lot of human benefit coming out of that. Technology really was front and foremost in a lot of this discussion at the Malaria Summit today. And, you know, he has previously talked about how technology can be used for bad, though, you know, in this case, using for good. What are his thoughts in particular about artificial intelligence? 
Yeah, you're right. We've heard from him in the past talking about potentially taxing robots and in, within artificial intelligence, he's been blogging about it himself, saying how he's not quite yet convinced about the future of AI in terms of its control, about where then the role of institutions is in ensuring that well, artificial intelligence is in the right hands of the right people. I wanted to really get his view on, on perhaps where the future of technology goes, if it is indeed a smooth path or not, and see Seemingly clearly he thinks there are bumps in the road and, and governments have a role to play here. Have a listen. Every technology brings with it both a lot of advance, you know, the automobile net is a very good thing, but uh, it, it brought in huge safety uh, challenges. Here where you're communicating online, the government's going to be involved in deciding what is hate speech that should be censored versus what's free speech? You know, not a simple issue only. The government gets to uh, draw that line. Uh, uh, so yes, government is very important to uh, look at why these new technologies may need uh, uh, new rules to go with them. New rules in the future, talking of hate speech, it made me really rather think that he was hinting at what Facebook had just been facing on Capitol Hill, Emily. On that note, you know, Gates himself was at the center of uh, congressional testimony a couple of decades ago. What are his thoughts on Facebook and whether Facebook and, and big tech at large should be better regulated? Yeah, I think he wouldn't actually go as far as to say, yes, regulation is necessary, particularly for the likes of Facebook. That's what I asked him directly. I said, should Facebook be regulated? And he, he seemed to think that perhaps it's unavoidable, but didn't say necessary. Have a listen. There are privacy rules. Those rules will continue to evolve as people see, you know, what's going on. And uh, Europe's got a new round of privacy rules. But you know, the, every two or three years, I think you'll you'll see more activity there. I asked him, look, any advice for the man, Mark Zuckerberg, as he comes up in front of regulators? I mean, he's a man who has experience in it. But he just gave a smile and seemed to think that, well, these things will come, Emily. All right, Bloomberg's Caroline Hyde for us live in London. Thank you so much, Caroline, for that interview with Bill Gates. Well, sticking with philanthropic tech giants, the man who sits ahead of Gates for the title of world's richest man is trying to make his mark in the battle against cancer. The Jeff Bezos-backed cancer startup called Grail is seeking to raise a billion dollars to boost growth ahead of its planned IPO. Grail, which plans to list in Hong Kong this year, is trying to create screenings that can diagnose people with early stage cancer before they show any symptoms. Another of Grail's investors, none other than Bill Gates. Coming up, AT&T and the DOJ are squaring off in court and the big names are taking the stand. What went down in antitrust court next? This is Bloomberg. Google's former CEO thinks that big tech companies should be working with the Pentagon when it comes to artificial intelligence. Appearing before the House Armed Service Committee on Wednesday, Eric Schmidt said that AI will be, quote, useful for defensive and perhaps offensive purposes, and that any efforts to make it easier for the Pentagon to work with the private sector would be welcome. One problem, though, his former employees don't agree. Over 3,000 Google employees wrote to current CEO Sundar Pichai demanding an end to deals that let the military use the company's AI technology. Well, the AT&T versus DOJ trial is well underway, and it just had its equivalent of a star witness taking the stand. Time Warner CEO Jeff Bukas had one response to every part of the government's attempt to block AT&T's $85 billion acquisition of the company. That was that it, quote, makes no sense. Bukas added that the deal wouldn't gain leverage over the competition and raise prices for its programming. Here now to tell us more, David McLaughlin, who covers the DOJ for Bloomberg and is coming right from the trial. So David, first of all, what do you make of Bukas's remarks today in court? Well, it's, it's, uh, he was pretty consistent with the story that AT&T and Time Warner have been telling right since this lawsuit was filed, and, and that is that the DOJ's claim that they're gonna come together and uh, gain extra leverage over other distributors and raise prices on other distributors for Time Warner content. And that in turn would, would uh, 
raise prices on consumers, uh, that that whole story is, is completely wrong because Time Warner wants to sell its programming to as many uh, distributors as possible, especially uh, over the top distributors that are uh, emerging right now. So that was his uh, that was his story on the stand, um, and as you said uh, throughout the questioning, he could just kept saying that the DOJ's case doesn't make any sense. Now, of course, this move is in part to fend off competitors like Netflix. Netflix specifically was mentioned in what context? Well, Netflix and other uh, 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 subscription services, uh, over-the-top streaming services like Sling TV, these are the competitors that um, both AT&T and Time Warner are concerned about. And so Time Warner's message uh, to the judge today was that to offer similar services with its own programming, it needs AT&T's distribution through DirecTV and DirecTV Now. Um, to go directly to consumers and also to collect data that's going to make advertising more valuable. AT&T's message is that um, it wants to offer the same services, but instead of contracting with Time Warner or going to Fox or Disney or another programmer and sort of negotiating, it wants to be able to control programming itself and it thinks more efficiently it can sell to consumers through DirecTV Now and other products. AT&T seems to be favored to win right now. Is that a fair assessment? And if so, why? Well, that's what the I would say the uh, a lot of observers, lawyers, and economists who have been watching the trial uh, for the past few weeks seem to think. Um, and that view comes down mostly to the government's uh, economic uh, expert uh, professor at the University of California, Berkeley. Um, and the criticism of him was that his model for predicting the price increases from this deal is very theoretical. Uh, it does not, it sort of ignores a lot of real world data like blackouts that have happened um, in the past between uh, distributors and programmers. And uh, the view is that the companies have done a pretty good job sort of pointing out those, uh, that those inputs are, aren't based on real world facts. And he also had the judge at one point uh, after he testified um, basically saying he was very con confused by his testimony. So that's not, that was not a good sign for the, for the government. <laughs> so the judge seems skeptical then. What happens if the government loses? Well, uh, if the government loses, then this merger um, would, would go ahead. I think there's some qu question about whether the judge could or would be able to um, put conditions on the deal. One of the conditions that uh, Time Warner and AT&T have offered is they've said to distributors, look, if we come in, if we have a dispute over programming, we won't go dark on you. We won't pull Time Warner programming during um, an arbitration process, so that should um, address any fears you have of, of losing that content. Um, plenty of distributors have cr criticized that nonetheless because it doesn't include HBO, for example. So I think there's some question whether the judge might uh, want to tweak that or suggest ways to tweak that, or, or he could um, just let the deal go through as is. I think we should just be cautious about trying to predict too much at this point um, because we don't really know what the judge is going to do. Um, and we won't know for probably a couple months. All right, Bloomberg's David McLaughlin, thank you so much for keeping us updated. I know you will continue to follow the trial and keep us posted. Well, the NBA's new professional video game league has signed a multi-year broadcast contract with Amazon's Twitch. The deal allows Twitch to live stream almost 200 games for the NBA 2K League, including tournaments, playoffs, and the finals. Twitch will have exclusive broadcast rights for the 2018 season. The NBA 2K League is a joint venture with Take-Two Interactive Software. And starting today, you will be able to go to the movies in Saudi Arabia for the first time in more than 35 years. AMC is opening a theater in Riyadh, and the first film will be the blockbuster Black Panther. The Saudis lifted their longtime ban on movie theaters five months ago, part of Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman's plan to open up the country.
Coming up, disrupting the disruptor. For years, Discovery CEO David Zaslav was upending the cable TV landscape. We'll find out what it is like for him now that the internet has people cut in the cord. Next, this is Bloomberg. Qualcomm has appealed a $1.2 billion fine that was imposed by the European Union for loyalty payments to Apple. The EU says Qualcomm offered significant amounts of money in rebates if Apple only used the company's computer chips. Chinese investors poured $1.4 billion into private U.S. biotech firms in the first quarter. According to PitchBook, that is about 40 percent of the more than $3.5 billion raised. This, as China looks to become a global leader in new medicines, it's unclear whether the trade rift between the two countries could slow the investments. Well, March was a rough month for Discovery Communications. Viewership across their spectrum of channels fell by 10 percent. That includes a 20 percent drop for their namesake network, as well as the Oprah Winfrey network. So just how is Discovery adapting to the shifting media landscape? Bloomberg's David Weston sat down with Discovery CEO David Zaslav in the latest episode of Bloomberg's Big Decisions for his thoughts on whether Discovery can survive the streaming wars. Take a listen. You know, we don't know. Everywhere else in the world, we're on almost every skinny bundle. Here in the U.S., we're in most of them. Uh, we're not on Hulu, and we're not on YouTube, but we're on most of the others. And uh, you know, people love our channels. And so, one, we think uh, that over time we'll get on those skinny bundles. We hope to. We'd like to be, we'd like to partner with our distributors because they helped us build our, our business. And in many cases, we are. We're partnering with AT&T on, on DirecTV Now. We partner with Brian on Comcast on his offerings with Charter. So that's the best way to do it kind of regionally. But there is an opportunity for us to go direct to consumer ourselves, which we're already doing in a number of areas, in cars and in sports. Um, but we could also go to those big companies. If you take a look at what NBC, ABC, CBS and Fox spent a couple, three years ago, and how much is being spent by Amazon, Netflix, Apple and Google, you know, that's, there's a massive amount of share shift that's uh, that's going on there. And these are real global companies, the likes of which we've never seen before. Mm. So if any one of those companies wanted to offer for five ninety nine a very a compelling family friendly service, you know, we would either be most of it, we would argue we'd like to be most of it, or we could be all of it and see how it goes. Because it, anywhere you go in the world and you say Discovery or Animal Planet or or ID um, or Oprah. Uh, people know our brands and they and they value them. How will you make that decision about whether you go direct to consumer or you go through middlemen, essentially? How do you make that decision as CEO? Well, look, the, uh, the, the right now it's not a fair fight <laughs> because the direct to consumer businesses, the Netflix, the Amazons, we in media used to trade at about a 14 multiple because the view was that this great uh, dual revenue stream cable and free to air business would go on forever. And uh, the view now is that it's getting disrupted by some of these direct-to-consumer platforms that are global. There's a question of who's going to emerge and be the winner. We think, looking now, it's only the second or third inning, but, but we've carved out a very compelling spot of quality brands that people love, that we can offer globally, and we could offer them ourselves. You know, if, as you look across Europe or here in the U.S., you see Randall uh, having to compete with those big companies. And uh, he's looking at 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 and T as an opportunity to own IP, to help decommoditize his platform that he spent so much money on. You talk about disruption in media. There was a time not too long ago when you were the disruptor in chief. In some sense, I watched you from Capital Cities ABC across the street as you created MSNBC and NBC. You created CNBC. How does this compare with that disruption when you disrupted broadcast? Basic cable came in and really disrupted it. How does it compare? What did you learn from that experience? You can apply now. Uh, patience. Um, uh, in that case, uh, Jack Welch and Bob Wright were committed to try and take the broadcast business into cable. For people that were around at that time, it was pretty unusual. And it's important because the business that you think you're going to launch that's going to work is never the business that works. The, the audience 
is always going to tell you what they get nourished by. And that's what, that's what our business is about. That's what most businesses are about. When we launched with, uh, with Oprah, the Oprah Winfrey Network, we had a dream, Oprah and I, that it was going to be about living your best life. And we looked strategically at the space and said, we can do this. But when we went out with the content, Super Soul Sunday worked terrific, but a lot of the other stuff was too earnest and the audience went away. And we had to figure out what are they going to come back for. And it took us a lot of years, but we started to listen, what do you like? That's what our business is about. We don't want everyone to watch, but the Oprah Winfrey Network now is the number one network for African-American women. So for us now, we're, we've broken our company in half, essentially. We got half the company that's about growing our channels, doing what we believe we can do as well or better than anyone in the world. Then there's a whole group that has to figure out, okay, how do I get over the top? What do people want when they consume content over the top? You know, And I think you have to be willing to recognize failure and use it kind of optimistically. Good, we know that now. That was Discovery CEO David Zaslav with Bloomberg's David Weston. And remember, you can catch the full interview tonight on Bloomberg Bits Decisions, 9.30 p.m. Eastern Time. Now back to our top story. I want to hop into the Bloomberg terminal. Amazon gaining in extended trading after CEO Jeff Bezos said the company has exceeded 100 million paid Prime members. Bezos noted the milestone in his annual shareholder letter and also said the e-commerce giant will continue to invest to meet ever-rising customer expectations. And that does it for this edition of Bloomberg Technology. Thank you so much for watching. Reminder, we're live streaming on Twitter. Check us out at Technology Weekdays, 5 p.m. in New York, 2 p.m. in San Francisco. That's all for now. This is Bloomberg.